Chapter 10, Part 2 It was near the end of June. One Friday night, Elise, leaving work, found a notice in her pay envelope. She was fired. There was no explanation. On Monday night she went back. She walked to her typing machine and sat down at all. And sat down at it. All the people she worked with stared, as if there was something frightening in this behavior. She'd known all of them for months, but no one acknowledged that. She took a piece of paper from the drawer and put it in the machine. She typed her name over and over again, and when that began to weary her, quote, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. One of the men came over and said discreetly, Miss Cowan, you know you're through here. Why don't you leave like a good girl? Quote, I want to know why I've been fired. Quote, just go, he said. Okay? She typed all the way down the page, so she removed it from the machine and reached for a fresh sheet. Quote, hey, what are you doing? Quote, I want to know the reason. Quote, get the boss, someone said. She said, uh, yes, she said, get the boss. She waited for him, ready to hear whatever he'd tell her. She'd be the first to agree she wasn't a particularly good worker. She made mistakes. She often came late. She let him let him also say, quote, Elise, you are a drunk and a stinking dyke. She was a human being like she was. She was a human being like he was. Human beings addressed each other directly. She'd sat typing, her pocketbook in her lap. Around her, people were gathering to gawk as they would at a street accident, and this distracted her from her work. She stopped and put her arms around the machine, feeling anchored by its heaviness. Speaking out clearly, she said, quote, I want a reason or explanation, and felt like Bart Bartleby and Scrivener sitting in his corner of law and office endlessly saying, quote, I would prefer not to. It was the police who came, three of them. They asked her to go with them, and when she refused, they began pulling at her arms, prying at her fingers, since she still held the machine in her embrace. Her glasses fell on the floor. Everything blurred as the three of them tore her away, dragging her out of the place in a rush, her feet scraping the ground. Quote, I want to know the reason. She cried one last time and got punched in the stomach going down the elevator. She called her father from the station house. Quote, this will kill your mother, he said. Leo Skur had called from Elise early Tuesday morning. Had a call from Elise early Tuesday morning. Her father and her uncle had come, and she'd been released without charges. She needed to see someone. Leo said they could meet on his lunch hour. A little while later, she called me and said she was leaving for California. At noon, Leo waited in a pizza joint on the Lower East Side, but Elise didn't show up. She was selling her books on 4th Avenue. She returned to her apartment packed one suitcase and slipped past her super's door with it, skipping out on the rent. That night I saw her off. In silence we ate chop soy specials in the maroon gloom of a Chinese restaurant, then sat together till midnight in the waiting room at the Greyhound Terminal, drinking bitter coffee out of cardboard containers watching the flotsam and jetsam of America arriving and leaving. She saved me a book, a tattered modern library edition of The Idiot. Quote, it's time for you to read it, she said gravely. Everyone looked like a fugitive that night. I didn't feel Elise was going to San Francisco, but somehow simply disappearing, merging into some appalling anonymity. <clears throat> I kept saying I'd be seeing her by the end of August. We were going to get an apartment together, weren't we? Meanwhile, she could get in touch with Jack, but it was still like someone going away forever. 
The phone rang late one night. It was Jack, calling from a bar in Berkeley. All day he'd be he'd been pacing in his yard thinking about what to say to me. Quote, Joycey, I don't know what to say how to say this, so I'll just say it honestly. I don't want you being disappointed by San Francisco. But this town is really nowhere. I wish I hadn't painted such glowing pictures and made you decide to throw up everything. I'm just warning you against the possible mistake that I myself started. Damn it. When I, came, when I asked him what was wrong, he said he'd been stopped by cops four times for walking in the street after midnight. One even had fined him two dollars for going through a red light. Because of the howl obscene, obscenity trial, there was all kinds of cop trouble. People's poetry books were being impounded. What would happen to Gregory's Gasoline or Evergreen Review Number 2, which had Howl in it? Quote, this is a mad, silly, stupid place. His coins ran out and he said he'd write me. He just wanted me to think hard about what I was doing. Quote, seeing you is all right with me any time, he said. Quote, I really like you. You're a real kid. A real true heart, but I just foresee being driven out of America. The letter he sent that week described California falling captive to what Jack called the total police authority. It was now a culture for old people on retirement, where cops prowled the streets all night to keep anyone else from having any fun. The quote, wild, end of the lavish California he'd loved so much was gone. Quote, imagine one woman imagine one woman writing in that if D Jesus Christ was alive he would have led the police to the bookstore to impound howl and all that kind of negative odd woman attitude all over the place with all these new dreary neat cottages and clean stripes with white lines in signs that say walk stop don't walk he knew he couldn't stand much more of it. Quote, I admit, I'm flipping, and I'm bugged everywhere. I go, but I can't make it here. Quote, uh, even, quote, glorious wild needle had been deprived of his freedom of movement. His license had been taken by the elderly police because he drove, quote, like a human being instead of an old man. It was possible the total police authority might eventually clap down on the east, although New York might prove too vast and ungovernable. Mexico was where he thought he'd have to settle. Maybe if I was still determined to get to San Francisco, we could go to Mexico together when he was ready to leave. But he'd rather start out with me from New York after Christmas. <clears throat> Quote, but if you dis but you decide what you want what do you excuse me but you decide and you do what you want he ended it was much harder than do what you wanted i was discovering than to do what you had to quite apart from what made practical sense i wished i'd gotten on the bus that night with elise which would have decided everything Uh, excuse me. Quote, I'm only going to be around for a little while longer. I kept telling him. Quote, I'm going to San Francisco. Then I'd go home and read Jack's letter again, and not be sure, and wonder if this mood had shifted back to liking California, or if it was really as terrible there as he said. Or was he saying that because it was me he wanted to escape? Was that the doubt? That was the doubt. I kept coming back to. Somehow I missed in that letter what I see in today so plainly. The strange, uh, excuse me, the strange pervasive elderliness of the total police authority with its, quote, negative old woman attitude, the neatness of retirement that it enforced, which now I connect with Mimer whom I didn't see yet as my overwhelming advent adversary. She was just an old woman who complicated things somehow. I wrote back that I was still leaving New York, as I'd planned. 
Would he still be in San Francisco when I got there? Had he heard from Elise or run into her anywhere? But there were no more letters from Jack for weeks. From Elise, I got only a postcard of Lombard Street. Quote, the crookedest street in the world. The crookedest street in the world. Most San Francisco houses were white, she informed me. Quote, style emphasized extremes norm. She had gone to the place. But not one that, but not one had seen Jack there. F oh, excuse me. She had gone to the place, but no one had seen Jack there for a while. Quote, a little east side sick, she wrote. But what was her life? Standing in a phone booth in the Cedar Bar one Saturday night in July, supplied with many quarters, I get the number of the place. Quote, a very well-known bar in North Beach, operator. Then make a call to Miss Elise Cohen, listening to the phone as it rings on the other side of America. It's a busy Saturday night out there, too, although three hours earlier. I have to remember that. When the bartender answers, there's a beery undersea roar behind him to anyone... Uh, to anyone would also hear if they tried to call the cedar. The operator asks for Elise, and I hear the bartender bellow out her name. Quote, Elise Cohen! Elise Cohen! Sorry, not here, he says. Quote, you're sure? I say. Quote, a dark girl with glasses, new on the scene. Quote, nope, sorry. I debate asking for Jack but feel too embarrassed by his fame out there. Quote, Karak? Everyone wants to speak to him. I step out of the booth back into New York time, where the night game at Yankee Stadium is on the radio and a lot of men are in shirt sleeves. A lot of men in shirt sleeves are listening to the familiar summer drone of it, speculating loud loudly on the next batter coming up like the patrons of an ordinary neighborhood bar. Setting up for the next round, which may be free if the spirit moves him, the owner wipes the bar down with his cloth. He likes his customers. They're all right, steady, big drinkers. Beer and wine mostly, some go in for boiler makers. He never planned to have an artist's bar. They came to him. What the hell? His customers have some running joke about the Courier and Ives prints on the walls. What's so funny about Courier and Ives? If you have walls, you you put something on them. One thing's as good as another. One week, the following story goes around the cedar. A well-known collector is morally outraged by an abstract painting he's seen on 10th Street. Well, what kind of painting is that? He demands. Call that a painting? An artist asks the furious man to describe what he's seen. Quote, well, it's about four by six and white with an eight-inch stripe of black down the middle. Quote, what more do you want? The artist says triumphantly. A zen-like rejoinder attributed to Franz Klein, who has the drooping, sharply pointed mustache of an oriental warrior, but brown eyes of sad, glinting kindness. At the end of the bar nearest the door, he sits and greets his cronies. Quote, have one on me. Come on. Fifty years old, and the money has just started to come in. He's like an amazed child. He'll get a bigger studio, buy a house on the Cape, maybe, hire some of these ragged kids fresh out of Black Mountain College to bring, to build his stretchers. Just today he bought a brush, the best brush he's ever had in his life. This wide. For twenty-five dollars. The cedar is like the Waldorf reborn, and in fact has some of the same patrons, but now I'm no longer an unconscious fourteen-year-old. One night I walked in, knowing no one. In less than a week, I have not only a frame of reference, but an enthusiastic Black Mountain boyfriend, sort of, named Fielding Dawson, whom, every, whom everyone calls Fee. About this last development, I have some guilt. 
quote, I'm not going to be around long, I informed Fee. Quote, as soon as I hear from Jack, I'm splitting from the coast. But since I don't hear from Jack, this plan of departure seems less and less real. Perhaps I'll never hear from Jack again. Perhaps the best way to have a love affair is to be the one leaving, not the one left. Meanwhile, I moved out of Connie's apartment into a room at the Yorkshire Hotel, where I once swore I'd never live. And indeed, the Yorkshire is only a place to store yourself. You can only be there when you're sleeping. I share a bathroom with an unseen stranger. It's between our two rooms. You unlock your door to get in. Lock this door. Lock his door from behind. Well, oh, excuse me. Lock his door from inside. Then vice versa. When exiting. If I live anywhere, I suppose it's at the cedar. I even walk down there sometimes on lunch hours, coming into its sudden brown twilight from the bright, busy street. I sit at a table in the back and write in my notebook an order. In my notebook, an order, Manhattan clam, clam chowder. To Hiram Hayden, who ha who asked to consider my novel for publication at Brandom House, I sent my Yorkshire hotel address on a postcard. He calls me up at work, sounding disapproving and fatherly, and he sighs. Quote, You've had so many addresses. Three in one summer is kind of a lot. Sometimes I go home with Fee to this little studio just off the Bowery, which is the worst place I've ever seen, worse than the Yorkshire or Elise's old room on 108th Street. The building seems about to fall. The building seems about to fall down. There are holes in the floorboards, chasms in the ceiling, no heat. But fortunately, it's not winter. A rusty trickle of water from one 1907 faucet papers, beer bottles, squeezed out paint tubes, accumulating laundry on the floor. I sit on the couch cot bed and Fee draws my picture on a large newsprint pad with lightning strokes of his charcoal pencil. Klein himself taught him to do it that way one summer at Black Mountain. Fee had been only 18 a dazzled kid fresh from the proud humiliation of high school oddball status in St. Louis. He had talked his mother into sending him to the green hills of North Carolina to meet America's avant garde. Not only Klein, but Buckminster Fuller, Paul Goodman, William de Kooning, John Cage, Merce Cunningham, Edward Dahlberg, Robert Creeley, and Charles Olson. It was an extraordinary collection of visionary, eccentric, overpowering individuals. Life in that experimental and ex incestuous community was so highly pitched that Fee, like other Black Mountain alumni I met, never quite got over it. Even Black Mountain's decline had been drastic. Schisms divided the faculty. The school ran out of money in 1954. That winter there was no coal and nothing to eat. One small group held out, chopping down trees for firewood, stealing food if necessary from the A&P, fighting over possession of the few available women, and drinking large quantities of the local moonshine. But by the last year of the entire, but by the last year the entire faculty was gone, except for the poet Charles Olson, and the painter Joseph Fior, and there were only a dozen ragged students remaining. One day in the fall of 1956, they all got into cars and drove away, drove sadly away, some heading west to San Francisco, others to New York and the village. <clears throat> Seven years later, after he first met Klein, Fee still has the look of a boy, the lanky grace of someone who dedicated his adolescence to sandlot baseball as he now dedicates himself to art, intoxication, and the intensities of the cedar, always ready to be woed. Quote, that kid Fee, the older painters say, with the rueful affection of elders watching the young sow wild oats. Klein buys him beer and sandwiches. Quote, if you drink, Fee, you have to eat. 
If I weren't in love with Jack, and maybe going away, I might be tempted to become Fee's, quote, old lady, straighten him out a little, clean up the studio, contribute to the rent, have a baby or two, become one of those weary, quiet, self-sacrificing, wildly respected women brought by their men to the cedar on occasional Saturday nights in their limp thrift shop dresses made interesting with beads. Even a very young woman can achieve old ladyhood, become the mainstay of someone else's self-destructive genius. It might also be enough to give on Fee Dawson's stories. The night Jackson Pollock's pleading bloodshot eyes appeared in the little white in the little window in the cedar's door, and John the bartender said, quote, You've been a bad boy, Jackson. You can't come in. The night that Franz, the night Bill de Cooting walked in and said, In fact, it's the storyteller in Fee that I can't resist. The, mem the memorialist of a hundred small occasions when in the ripening atmosphere of some midnight or endless beery afternoon came the moment when the absolutely right and perfect irreducibly masculine thing was said or demonstrated unforgettably an illumination worth waiting for hours worth waiting hours for quote you see don't you Exhausted, he sways on his bar stool as he tries to convey it, nearly tearful, brown cowlicks falling over his forehead. In Fee, there are echoes of Jack and Alan that I'm responsive to in men. Some pursuit of the heightened moment, intensity for its own sake, something they apparently find only when they're with each other.